Good morning, everybody. It's great to see all of you. Uh, will you stand up and sing with us this morning as we start the singing portion of our worship service? I'm one of the worship leaders here at Community Church of Greenwood. Um, while it's wonderful to see you, I can't tell if a single one of you are singing this morning. <laughs> there are no mouths moving in this place. <laughs> 
But aside from all the changes that are going on around us, we are so glad that you're here. We are going to be continuing our series in Proverbs, the book of wisdom this morning. Um, God's word says that, um, that the beginning of wisdom is knowledge. And knowledge comes from a communion with the Lord. And that's why we're here today, is to commune with him in the various types of worship, whether it's song or prayer or community or reading his word. So as we continue um, in our singing this morning, I pray that you would just settle in the knowledge of who the Lord is and allow him to pour into you because he has wisdom for us to hear this morning. Surrender your hearts. Spirit of the living 
Yes, Father. We thank you for your presence here this morning. And we thank you for your wisdom and your word. We are hanging on your every word, Lord. We open our ears and our minds and our hearts to you. Father, speak to us in this place. Um, be with Bill this morning as he brings a word from you. I pray that it would be pure and holy and pleasing to you. We thank you um, for meeting us here, Father. We put all this before you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. My name is uh, Bill Turner. For those that I've not met yet, I would uh, love to be able to do that. And I'm just one of the guys on staff. And um, actually today I kind of get the pleasure uh, of starting this off. And, and so really looking forward to that. But if you don't know us, if you have questions about us, if, if you just want to get to know some staff members a little bit later after service, if, as you exit out the doors, if you just look to your left, you'll see a table with flowers on it. Um, compliments of Delora, I promise you. Um, but Delora or I will be out there to greet you. If you want to meet Pastor Jason, he may be out there also. Uh, but we'd love just to get to know you and just get to know your story. So I want to invite you to do that. If you've been with us for a little while and, and you want to know more about us that way, we're also going to do a class called First Steps. It's going to start September the 9th. It'll be a Wednesday night. It's four weeks. And uh, if you have questions about that, just let us know and we'll answer all of those for you also. I was reading a devotional this week, and it's called New Morning Mercies by Paul Tripp. And I want to read you this paragraph. And as I read it, I want you to see if you fall into any of these categories. And here we go. Too much of our emotional energy is sapped by worry. Too many of us are captured by discouragement. Too many of us are often motivated by fear. Too many lose sleep because of worry. Too many of us feel our lives are out of control. Too many of us wish that we had power that we will never have. And too many of us are paralyzed by regret. Too many of us wonder where God is and what he is doing. And too many of us think that it's us against the world. Too many of us, when we are assessing our lives, leave out the ultimate explanatory fact, the existence, the character, and the plan of God. The existence the character, and the plan of God. Proverbs 16, 1 through 3 says, To a man belong the plans of the heart, but from the Lord comes the reply of the tongue. All of a man's ways seem innocent to him, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and your plans will succeed. I read that verse this week, and I read the paragraph that, that I just shared this week, and it, it became very apparent that I have a responsibility. My responsi responsibility should include tons of humility, but I need to make plans. I need to make choices. God has given me that responsibility, but what I have to never forget is, is that God controls all things. God controls the results of my plans. God controls the action of my plans. So I have that ability. I can make decisions. I can propose next steps. But all the while, I have to know that God is in control of all things. As I was preparing for this, I wrote myself a question, and I'll just ask you the same question. Do I plan first and then pray? Or do I pray first and then plan? And if I'm honest, I do a little of both. How many times have I made a plan and then I've asked God to bless my plan, to do it the way that I thought it should be done, instead of going to him first and finding out, Lord, what is it, the plan that you, ha that you have for me? So if you've been in stores lately, you've seen the signs, right? There's a coin shortage, which... I don't know, I have all the coins that I need in my office, so I thought, well, it's not that much of a shortage. But it got me to thinking, you ever heard the saying that there's two sides to every coin? So this morning I pulled out about 
30 quarters that I have up there, and I started looking at one side, and honestly, they all looked the same. You couldn't tell the difference. You, it was just the way it was. But then when you turned them over to the other side, all of a sudden, there were coins from Maine. There were coins from Ellis Island. They had meant all these different sides of it. It's the same coin. It takes both sides to make one. But if I only look at one side, if I only view it from one point, that becomes the only point of view that I have. One side of the coin today is free will. The idea that as humans we can express personal choice and our conduct is not simply determined by physical or divine forces. But on the other side of the coin, God is sovereign. God has the power to do anything he wants in any situation. He often chooses to act or not to act for reasons of his own. His sovereignty means that he is absolute in authority. He's unrestricted in his supremacy. But God is a personal God. So God is always involved to things to the point that he directs them to fulfill our purposes. God is involved in our plans. God is involved in our relationships. God is involved in our spiritual disciplines. God is in control, and yet we have a responsibility to make decisions that allow us and our families to become more like Jesus which honestly is God's purpose for our lives. So somehow, as we read these passages, we have to figure out, how do we honor both sides? How do I honor the free will that God has so graciously given me? And how do I honor the fact that he is sovereign, which actually gives me comfort? So as you read through the scriptures, they affirm that, that we do cause things to happen, that, that we have choices, and our choices bring about real results. But ultimately, God is in control. And yet somehow, God upholds our ability to make choices and results. Even though he's in control, we have to understand that with those choices, there is still accountability. There is still responsibility. So let me ask you this for you guys. Is, is there any comfort in the idea that, that, that although we make choices, although that we make plans, that we're not ultimately in control? Any of you ever made a bad decision that somehow God worked out for your benefit? Do you really believe that God is good? It's a question I've had to wrestle with over the last few years. Do I really believe that God is good? Do I really believe that God is for me? That no matter what, no matter what, God has this. And then I looked at the Bible, and do you realize that the opening chapter of the Bible is about us being with God? And then do you realize that the closing chapter of the Bible is about us being with God. I want to be careful with that because we are to be with God. We are not to be above him. We are not to be under him. We are not to be from him. We are not to be for him because as soon as we do those things, we have a whole set of rules that we have to follow, but we are to be with him. God is good. He is for us. And as a believer, he has you in his hand. Rest in that. So we need to make our plans. We need to trust God. We need to let him birth those plans. We need to let God finish those plans. We have to be able to set as we pray, as we plan, as we make our choices and believe that through all of this, God is for me. 
Some of us sitting out here today go, yeah, we totally understand that. And some of us sitting out here today go, we're not so sure that God's for me. So I don't want you to take my word for it. Let's go to the word. Let's go to Romans 8.28. And here's how it goes. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Now, I want to be careful because that's where we always stop that verse. Right? We quote it to people all the time. And and we stop it. All things work out for your good. But let's read it in its entirety. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purposes. I'm really a pretty simple guy, so I read that and I thought, well, great. God, what's your purpose? Right? You ever ask yourself, God, what's the will for my life? What is it that you want me to do? I'm ready to go. You just tell me what it is and I'll do it. And I kept reading. And we get to verse 29, and here's what it says. His purpose is that we would be conformed to the image of his son. God's will for your life, that you would be conformed to the image of his son. Sandy and I, 1998-ish, we were going to buy a house. And this was one of those times that I planned first and then prayed. And I signed the paperwork, and we sold our house, and we did everything, and we were ready to go. And I wake up one morning, and in in my gut, I know I should not have bought that house. It was so bad that I physically was starting to get sick over it, and there was nothing I could do about it. I had signed all the papers. it It was a go. And so I prayed, God, if you don't want me to buy the house, then you got to do something. Because I've already done my part in this. Even though it was wrong, I did it. You do whatever you want and we will be okay. About three days later, we were supposed to close. I hadn't heard a word. And then I get a call from my real estate agent. She goes, Bill, we can't close today. We have to postpone it. Paperwork's not ready. I said, okay. A couple days later, I get the same phone call. Finally, I say, hey, Bonnie, kind of tell me what's really going on here. I'll find out. She calls me back. She says, Bill, I have the worst news ever. I'm like, oh my gosh, who died? And she says, the people buying your house can't buy it. Their paperwork didn't go through. It wasn't a done deal like we were told it was supposed to be. And my response was, Bonnie, that's not the worst news ever. That is actually an answer to prayer where God is doing something good with something that didn't do good. Well, three houses fell through that day. We never did buy that house, by the way. Don't know why, but it's all right. So does your plan ask God to get involved first? Or does your plan ask God to bless what you've already done? Does your plan include becoming more like Jesus. Somebody asked me one day, well, how do I do that? How do I, how do I become more like Christ? How do, I, how do I just walk with him every day? And I'm like, well, first you have to give your life to Christ. You just have to make the decision that, God, you're God and I'm not, and I'm going to follow you wherever you lead me. I'm going to allow you through your Holy Spirit to work inside of me, to transform me into the image of Jesus Christ. If you guys know me, that's been a slow process. But he's doing it. So there's free will on one side and God is in total control on the other side. We want to make it an either-or argument? It's really not. It's a both-and. It's not a curse that God's in control. Can I tell you that? It takes some humility to allow God to be in control, but it's not a curse that God is in control. I hope you look at that as actually a blessing. You're important. You have meaning. You make a difference. 
But with God in control, it really should allow us to make our plans, to make our choices, to get God involved with it, and have the assurance that we get transformed into the image of his son. When I went to college, I tried my best to try to stop believing in God. I'd grown up in a church. I had walked away from it when I was 16. I I decided I wanted to live a lifestyle that was totally against God. And and I just tried to not believe in God anymore. You ever done that? Couldn't do it. As much as I wanted to live it the way I wanted to, I could not walk away from this knowing that that God was real and knowing that Jesus Christ was real and, and knowing all of that. So here's what I did. I just ignored him thought that'll work. That didn't work so well either. We've all tried that a little bit sometimes, but I was trying it on on a grand scale. And so then what I decided to do was, well, I have to believe what I believe. And so I decided that everything had to be predestined by God. Everything. I wanted to believe that no matter how I lived, no matter how I thought, no matter decisions I made, that that God would do what God wanted to do, and I had no responsibility. I wanted to believe that my actions, that my thoughts, that my beliefs would not affect anyone unless, unless God wanted them to. And therefore, it wasn't my problem. I just wanted to live a life with no responsibility. And even beyond that, I wanted to live a life with no accountability. So I completely abandoned the idea that God is a personal God who wants to be in relationship with me and that I have responsibility in my walk with Jesus Christ. So how do you think my college days worked out? It was a train wreck. In my ignoring God, I did not become more like Jesus. And today, I hear this. You ever heard the saying, let go and let God? Can I tell you that's horrible theology? We have a part. We have a role. We have effort to put forth. We are to plan. We are to propose And then we need to allow God to do what God does and follow him in that path. So do I need to believe in the saving power of Jesus? Absolutely. Of course I do. And that is the beginning of a relationship with God. But even in that, the Bible is clear that my choices matter. The Bible is clear that my choices are important. But God still controls. So what's your plan? Does it involve becoming more like Jesus? Let me ask you this question. Where does worship and study and prayer and family and community show up in your plan? If we took your plan and we threw it up on the screen right now, what would your priorities be? Did your plan involve you planning and then praying for God to bless it? Or did your plan involve, God, I'm going to ask you to make my plans for me. Give me the desires of my heart. Let me line up with you. Does it leave room for God to conform you to the image of Jesus? What's God's purpose for you? To be conformed to the image of his son. And for some of you sitting here, I just got to say this, but do you realize that having no plan is a plan, right? I'll repeat that. Having no plan is a plan. Indecision and apathy, it's a plan. If you don't have a vision, if you don't have a destination, then please, please, please don't be upset where you end up. So the plan belongs to us. Proverbs goes on, but from the Lord comes the reply of the tongue. 
Now, I first read that, and I thought, well, Lord, what does that have to do with making plans? A gentleman with the last name of McGee says it this way, you may plan and I may plan or arrange this, but when the time comes to speak or act, God is the one who is going to have the last word. We may make a great boast, but only God can give the final answer. It is the Lord who ultimately establishes our plans and allows them to come to fruition. Another friend of mine, we were sitting eating lunch, and I was talking about this a little bit, and, and he put it in a whole different way for me, maybe one that I could understand. Here's what he said. I choose to breathe, but God allows it. And if I choose to hold my breath, I can for a while. And then God makes me take the next breath. So God will, through relationship with him, bring your goals, bring your heart, bring your plans in line with his will for you. And because of that, we can desire the same things that God desires. Because my plan is to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Any of you ever been afraid of making a mistake and doing something that, that is not God's will? Ever been afraid of making God angry? Ever been afraid of that, that God would withhold his love from you? Okay, I'm the only one. Can I tell you something? This is where my assurance comes from. Nothing can take me out of the hand of God. If you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, nothing can take you out of his hands. So please, don't, again, don't take my word for this. We're going to go to Romans 8, 31. Here's how it goes. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present or the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There are a lot of things there that God said, these cannot take you out of my hand, but there's one phrase there that we can't bypass, and here it is, in all creation. We are created beings. I can make mistakes, and God does not take me out of his hand. God does not withhold his love. He may correct he may discipline, he may put me on the right path, but I never lose my relationship with Jesus Christ. God has the final word. So as I looked at this, it was like, well, the, the Father rules, the Son saves, and the Holy Spirit seals my future with God. So today, really, I hope you have a relationship with Jesus. I hope it's strong and vibrant, and I Truly hope you have made the decision to trust in him and his perfect sacrifice on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. It's been a long time, but I still remember the day that I had to admit that I could not save myself. I had to admit that my way was not enough and that I needed Jesus to forgive my sins. And as I did that, I came into relationship with Jesus Christ. I hope today that you're allowing yourself to be with God in your walk. I hope you're overwhelmed in his total love for you. I, I hope you can acknowledge his total acceptance of you just as you are. So if you've never made the decision to follow Jesus, honestly, I hope today's the day. I hope today's the day that you fully give your life and you allow his spirit to line up with your spirit I hope today is the day that you ask him to forgive you where you needed to be forgiven and commit to spend, to spend the rest of your life with God. 
And trusting in the fact that because of Jesus and his death on the cross and because of his resurrection from the dead, we can be saved. And if you've been walking with Jesus for a while, I hope you're allowing God to keep you humble. I hope you're allowing God to keep a teachable spirit in you. I hope you're allowing God to allow you to spontaneously love your enemies. And if not, ask for his forgiveness and allow God's spirit to draw you to be more like Jesus. So we have free will. We get to make choices. We get to make decisions. We get to make plans. And our assurance in all of that is that behind us, God is sovereign, and he controls our actions and our results and our future. And we all know people that that who are walking around, and, and they will tell you, absolutely, I believe in God, and absolutely, I believe in a God who loves me. But it's not changing their lives. And part of the reason is that when we get to some of this, It's an idea that's just abstract. And so I love that this morning I get to stand here and I get to ask Pastor Jason to come out and he's going to help us figure this from the abstract to the personal. Well, thank you, Pastor Bill. Bill made you think. Give me a thumbs up. Pastor Bill, make you think a little bit this morning, make you think about God. I want to share just a moment about how we can think with God, and I want to share a little bit of my own experience. In some way, Pastor Bill, uh, he gives you the tell, and I'm the show today. And I want to share a little bit about what God has done and what God is teaching me. And uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to all of you who've been praying for me. I can look around this room. I can look up in the balcony. I can look at the camera. People are at home, and I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that God's prayers are working in my own life. Amen to that. I want to share just very, very briefly, um, some of you may be new and not aware of what has gone on, but 24 days ago, Thursday afternoon, I was actually in my office with Pastor Bill and had weird uh, pain in my legs, which is, I live in just tightness and pain and all that, so I was trying to stretch out, and it usually goes away, and it didn't go away. And by the time I got home, by the time I got to the hospital, I needed a wheelchair to get in the hospital. And then uh, that, that began a, uh, an eight-day stint at Eskenazi Hospital and a multitude of blood tests, MRI, CT scans, EMGs, EKGs, angiograms, and the like. And at the end of it, they've said, you, have a spinal co- you, you experienced a spinal cord stroke, which led to some nerve damage, which um, still the, the absolute cause of that is still unknown. So we're still living in some of that uncertainty, but uh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, doctors. Thank you, physical therapists. I've gone from walker (laughs) to no walker to getting a lot of mobility back. So that's where I am on the journey, and I say thank you. Thank you to that. But I want to say this today. What I have to share with you is independent of the progress I have made. Because there's a point where God meets us in the depth of our pain and the height of our uncertainty that's real. So I don't say God is good because I'm doing better. I'm saying God is good because God is good. So let me unpack that just a little bit. I haven't been in front of a microphone for a while, so I will be brief. 
But as I go back to that day with Pastor Bill, it was interesting to me that God had led us in the book of Proverbs. Happened to have just preached on Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. That's what we had, I had written about a trust barometer. (laughs) To what extent do you trust God independent of circumstances? I was preparing on that Thursday to preach about how God disciplines us, how God works in us through hardship, through trial. And then this happens to me. Interesting how God works. And I believe that God is preparing me, God is preparing us as a church for many things, and more to come on that. But Kim and I, uh, if you don't know Kim, I am blessed to have an awesome, awesome wife. And when you're in a hospital in these days, you don't have people with you all the time. So one to four, I could see her every day. I was also blessed that my daughter, who's an OT, works at Eskenazi, so I got to see her a little bit more. But in the middle of this, and prior to this, we had been reading some things. Kim had shared some things that the Lord was working on her heart about how God is with us, what it really means to abide, to experience, to not just think about God in the abstract, but to experience his presence in reality. So I'm here to, I'll use an old word, testify (laughs) that God is good, that he's good all the time. And in the midst of my deepest pain, anxiety, and fear, he met me and I experienced a deep joy. And I believe that suffering removes the blindness that keeps us from seeing God's presence with us independent of circumstances. And I experienced that. And one of the practical ways I experienced that, uh, didn't sleep much, but uh, Andrea, who's on the keys, she and some others had put together a playlist of worship songs. And that became a lifeline for me. I would worship in the middle of the night, and I would cry out to the Lord. There comes a time when you you stop just saying, help me, Jesus, with this, 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 and you just worship. That's what I experienced. You just worship with open hands, ready to receive. That was my experience. So I am blessed that I can squat, I can walk, I got to get this left toe working, and we'll be walking briskly. It didn't heal my cartilage in my knee. I still got to deal with that. We can brace that up and go. But I'm in the pool. I'm doing all kinds of cool stuff. But God met me in the depth of my pain. And I want to say to you today that this joy, there's a sense in which you can talk about this stuff all you want. But then when you experience it, in the depth of your pain, height of uncertainty, and say it is real. So wherever you are today, I know many of you came to pray for me at the prayer service, and my request was, blessed be your name. I love that song because it says, blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be, blessed be your name. But there's another verse to that that says, blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. One of my kids says, Dad, I know you're preaching all, but I can't sing that right now. I cannot sing that verse right now. I said, that's okay. God will meet you where you are. So I know some of you today, you may hear these things and you may say, I can't sing that verse in my heart today. God is still present. (laughs) God is still with you. I would simply say, now is a time to be open, to be open to receive, even if your head can't get there, even if you still have questions, you still have doubts, you still have uncertainty, you're still asking these why God questions, 
but I want to say God is with us in the depth of our pain. So we're going to come to the communion table right now, and I want you to do this right now. I just want you to open up your palms. Just as a posture of openness. And I want to talk about communion for just a minute. You don't have to grab the cup yet. But I want you to think with me. Let's think with God for a minute. Let's talk about communion. Maybe you want to close your eyes and maybe you want to think about this. But when we come to the communion table, it's a concrete reminder that God is with us. When you think about the bread, when you think about the cup, when you think about this was Passover when Jesus gathered with his disciples. And they were reminded, God was with you way back. God was with the people of Israel. He led them out of slavery. This is a reminder. This is a look back. And Jesus is saying, I am with you right now. His disciples didn't understand it. They didn't understand. But I'm with you now. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit if you need help. And I'm going to be with you in the future. So there's a past, there's a present, and there is a future with the Lord's table. So now we're going to receive the, the bread and the cup together. So what I'd like you to do, I want you to take your cup. And I'm going to read from Matthew 26. But I want you to go ahead and open up that top flap. And I want you to hold the bread in your hand. And we come from different backgrounds and different ways, different forms of doing communion. But I want you to take this wafer in your hand. And I want you to hear these words from Matthew 26. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take eat. This is my body. So together, let us take and eat. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So together, let us drink the cup. And Jesus concludes by saying, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. God is with us in the past. God is with us in the Let us pray. Father, we come to you this morning, and many I know sitting here, many listening at home are coming in the midst of pain and uncertainty. Remind us that you are present with us. As we receive the bread and the cup, we say thank you, Jesus, that you are present with us. May we all be open to receive today. Through the Holy Spirit, make yourself real to us. Jesus, it's in your name, the name that is above every name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us again?
Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Cause Jesus, you're my the song that when sin is great, grace is more. So when we're assessing our lives, most of us leave out the explanatory fact, the existence, the character, the plan of God. My prayer for you today is that each of you would acknowledge who God is and who you are, and that you would allow God to transform you into the image of Jesus Christ. So today, I encourage you to humbly make your plans, to allow God to have purpose in your life, to make your walk with Jesus Christ a priority above all things. So this week, I encourage you to make your choices. Let God be God. God bless. Hope you have a great week. See you next Sunday.